from uh, from the C7081. There's not going to be any uh, mention of R. You'll be possibly glad to hear, I'm not sure. Um, let's have a look then. So share. I'm just going to my whole screen. OK, and hopefully uh, you have to let me know whether or not you can see my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? I can get a thumbs up from, um, from George there, who's just across the other side of the room. So as, as, as Ed mentioned, yeah, it's a project that uh, was done within the university. Ed was actually involved with it, as was um, Joe Roberts uh, from Entomology and, um, and Tom Pope. So this this was the concept. Um, there's a little weevil down in the bottom corner. Uh, they quite destructive. Um, they, 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 they do ornamental plants. They also do food crops. Uh, they they have the um, uh, the behavior that they like to hide in dark places during the daytime. And uh, it, it was thought that we could exploit that. There are commercial traps and I say trap because what tends to happen is that the weaver will go in and then come out again so um, uh, trap is probably a bit of a misnomer but uh, if you can imagine one you'll see a picture of it in a minute like an upturned plant pot what will happen the weaver will go in underneath and it'll have its picture taken and uh, hopefully the, the the system will uh, identify the presence of weevils and let somebody know about it so something can be done uh, it's not the plan to trap them or kill them and the idea is that it would be maintenance free. Uh, oops, oops, going too far. OK, so this is uh, this is I've sort of jumped ahead a little bit, but this is the finished trap just so that you know where the images that you're going to see are coming from. So like I said, it's an upturned plant pot at its heart. Uh, the the picture C there is the sort of weevil's eye view of what's going on. So that's uh, looking up towards the camera, which is the tiny little circular thing in the middle. Uh, around it are some LEDs. And what happens is the um, the Raspberry Pi, which is this sort of microcontroller you can see bolted on the side there, uh, it, it orchestrates the, everything that goes on, basically. Uh, so it can uh, turn on the LED briefly, take a picture, uh, do some processing, and then through the antenna, uh, which is sticking up, uh, transmit information back to the user in a, in a useful form. Just whilst we're looking at this slide, other notable things, it's as well as the image to detect whether or not we've got weevils, we, we've put a couple of uh, sensors on there. So the one not, label B is a, a light integrator. So that measures the strength of illumination. Uh, C is, I think, a um, humidity sensor and a temperature sensor combined into one. So for the purpose of this project, we uh, we, we we recorded all of this data. So this is the view from inside the trap and things to note in this are that uh, well you can see a weevil there's one weevil there uh, you can also see lots of uh, little uh, raisins should we call them so that's actually weevil poop um, and at the top of the image you can see that using python i'll explain how for later on but using python and opencv the the data from the census has been overwritten onto the image. Uh, the sensors themselves, and indeed the clock, which has told us here that it's uh, 1600, four o'clock in the afternoon, are connected on a thing called an I squared C bus, which is just technical information that might be interesting for people who, who use Raspberry Pis. Uh, oh, the, the other thing to note is that uh, because it's inherently dark inside this pot, uh, it's actually very useful for a computer vision task because one of the problems you often get when you're taking pictures of things and then trying to decide what they are, particularly if you go outdoors, is that when the light changes, things look different. Here we've got the luxury of having the lighting controlled from the LED. Uh, you can see some light ingress from the edge. So this is taken whilst the you know it is light outdoors. And this is typically when, when the uh, weevils would come clambering in. So to summarise the, the challenges and solutions that we're, we're going to try and solve, um, it might not just be weevils that come 
come in looking for darkness. So, uh, you know, we don't want to be counting them, assuming that they're you know, making the assumption there when they're not. So we're going to use AI to classify them. Uh, weevils, as you'll see in upcoming photographs, like to huddle together. Uh, that makes it a very difficult uh, task, actually, for identification. Sheep tend to do the same thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so we solve that by um, by taking a picture every 10 minutes and uh, and and concentrating on things that have uh, moved and uh, so so isolating single single insects in that way and and then the other thing is that the a, 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 a trap such as this needs to be very it needs to be effective but it also needs to be very cheap if it's going to be deployed and commercially viable so we started with a raspberry pi which is in it by its nature very reasonably cheap it's just um 30 or 40 pounds uh, as is the camera so the, the whole thing is, is probably less than 100 pounds which if, if you were making it quantity would would come down come down still further so what a lot of what i'm going to talk about is the techniques that have been used to make the processing simple so that it can be done on the raspberry pi uh, Okay, so the trap itself works in, in two modes. First of all, when you're using AI to do a classification uh, of, of the images, you, you have to train it and you need a training set. That means you have to gather a lot of the examples of what it is you want it to discriminate against. So in our case, <clears throat> it's weevils versus anything else. Well, there wasn't much else coming in because it was it, it was never deployed in the wild it was always in laboratory conditions um so it, it was only ever exposed to weevils and earwigs um so in the first mode it, it runs capturing training data and then later on you'll see it switches over and then it becomes a working product and it it sends reports of what it finds off to the user so what we're looking at here is the the picture taken on a 10 minute cycle by the camera looking down you'll see what i was talking about there is a big clump of um, huddled together weevils makes it very difficult uh, there's a lot of poop there and um it, it would it, which really precludes using object detection it would be very difficult to do object detection in in this as opposed to classification so uh it, so, so what what uh, what we've done is is we've taken the image from ten minutes ago, and we've compared it with the image from now, and got the uh, conventional computer vision to identify regions of interest. In this case, that means anything that is is there that wasn't there before. It draws a box around. Well, that's that's great. Uh, and for the most part, it does capture in insects on their own. But you can see here, there are uh, seven circles, but actually only five usable images. One of them's not usable. I'll use my mouse. I don't know if you can see it here. It, it's, it's caught, you know, somebody joined the huddle and that's just not going to be a usable image. Here we've got what looks like two insects standing next to each other. So that's not going to be useful. So we needed to develop a way of taking these 100 by 100 pixel regions of interest and filtering them out so that they look like these two images we see here. And we do that using uh, using Python and OpenCV, the code of which is up on um, is up on GitHub. So we can have a look at that. Uh, just check. Yeah, so let me just go forward. OK, so before I take you and show you the code, I want to introduce the, the concept. Uh, and, and here we're, we're using a, a library in OpenCV, which is called OpenCV for Python. And this this is just uh, an example of how you install libraries in Python. It's very, very simple these days. And I promise this would be the only time I mention R. It's, it's analogous to when you use the library command in R to bring in a, a load of functions that you can use for a particular problem or group of problems. So here uh, are the, uh, the the three images together are three examples of 
what might have been regions of interest, only one of which is a valid passport style photograph for us to perform classification on. The image on the left is, is, is no good because it's it's got two insects in it. What, you know, <laughs> is it an earwig? Is it a weevil? How can you classify it? It's got both in the picture. Uh, the one on the right is no good because it's just a, a, a mishmash of insects. Could be could be anything really. So the first technique was to get the center of <laughs> center of um, gravity, if you like, of of an image. That is, if you imagine that ink is heavy, this picture on the left would be pulled down towards the left, and the center of gravity would be where the yellow dot is. So that we would discard that image. We would say the center of gravity is too far beyond some threshold away from the center, and we're discarding it for that reason. The second one is perfect. You can see it's, it's spotted the middle of that earwig, but the one on the right also appears perfect because whilst there's more than one insect, they're, they're evenly distributed around the edge, thus balancing the picture. So we had to employ a second method a uh, second filter, if you like, so we could say if it passes this first test, so the, this this the earwig did, and so did the the huddle. Uh, oops, then uh, apply a second simple test, and it really is a simple test, and that is uh, how much how much darkness is there in the picture, uh, because for one insect, we you know take yeah we, we assume the insects isn't going to be bigger than a certain amount and most of them won't be you know the, to the point where it's uh, it's not really significant and and here what i mentioned before about how we've got control of the lighting it makes it possible to do that because the the background is always going to be the same color and we can convert it to a binary image and then basically just count how many black pixels more than a certain threshold probably more than one insect discard the image and it and it doesn't matter if we discard some images that actually were just one insect because we're just generating a training set and we'll get some more so what does that look like in in terms of actual code well we can go to github uh, i think ed was just talking about github it's a, it's a brilliant place you can do all sorts of things host your projects uh, above all uh, you can, if you want to, you can make it public like this one is. So any of you are perfectly welcome to come up to this URL at the top and you will see what I'm seeing and you can access my code. You can uh, clone the repository. You can copy whatever you like. It's all it's all there uh, to be shared. So what happened here was we, we ended up with a data set. Of uh, or a training set, I should say comprising earwigs and weevils. Now, there's, there were many more. You can see there were 1300 weevils to 199 earwigs. My feeling was that it was better to train uh, with equal sized sets. I think that is known to be good practice. Uh, so I discarded <laughs> most of the weevil uh, images. I just kept a couple of hundred. And, and of course, we could experiment. We could try using all 1300. We could try different different things. Uh, but in here, all, all you'll find is that there's lots and lots and lots of pictures of weevils that have been filtered, and there's lots and lots of pictures of earwigs or vice versa. So the code uh, to do the filtering that I was just talking about, you would find that in Python. Uh, it's a Python utility and here it is. So you'll see this is anybody who's familiar with Python will immediately recognize this as, as Python script. Uh, we import the CV2 library, that's computer vision 2, that is OpenCV. And uh, I've just created a little uh, function called filter by momentum and it, it imports the image like I alluded to before. It converts from a, a color image to a binary image by thresholding anything above a certain um, pixel intensity. So it, it, uh, Im images tend to have uh, each pixel has a value between 0 and 255, which represents its brightness. In a color image, that's it. You would have three lots of that for each one. There would be a red, a green, and a blue. Once you've converted it to a binary image, uh, 
or a grayscale image will have just one channel, which is from 0 to 1255. Uh, but if you threshold it, you end up with a binary image. So each pixel is either a 1 or a 0, and then it's very easy to use. This is just a function. I'm not doing anything clever here. I'm just using the CV2 moments function, giving it the threshold. And it gives me back um, where it is. And I've I've said that if it's not uh, an, a perfectly balanced one would be uh, with the because it's a 100 by 100 pixel image, a perfectly balanced image would have uh, the center of mo moment in the middle at 50 50. So I've said that if it's uh, more than one away from that. It's unbalanced. And then I've gone on to say if it's unbalanced and the um, the overall intensity of the image is outside of a particular band. It's uh, it's a bad egg. Otherwise, save the image, and that's the, uh, the there's your training image. So that that's how those are created. Check. Uh, yeah, and 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 the the, the power behind using uh, a passport style photo is. It's sort of well known. I mean, if you on your passport photos, you've all got them. You don't have your passport taken with a, a group of friends <laughs> or, or just one friend standing next to you. So same principle applies here. OK, so having got my. Uh, my. My training set, I need to do some training and I'm going to do that in something called TensorFlow. And I'm going to do it on something called Google Colab, which is a, a cloud based uh, platform that allows you to um, access some pretty uh, fast, uh, fast processing. Uh, we're using GPUs, which is important for, for training on uh, computer vision problems and deep learning problems. So. This this is my Google Colab, you can see a few projects typically you use a thing called Jupyter notebooks which are fantastic if you start doing uh, tutorials online for machine learning or for any sort of python it's you're probably going to be working in uh, these and it's just like oh yeah i'm going to mention r again it's just like r markup actually uh, so one thing to watch for so here it was look 4th of march i i got a let me just quickly go to show you where I got this from. So this is TensorFlow. This is what I intended to use for my training. Uh, and you can see it's TensorFlow Lite, and it says for mobile and edge. So this means it's for devices that are low powered. And by edge, it means right next to reality. So it's so if you've got like the cloud, which is where Google Colab is, uh, maybe doing some processing, uh, or you might have something up on the Amazon web service, uh, you know, you, you might send it a picture. It might do uh, classification or object detection for you and send a result back to an edge device, uh, which might be your mobile phone or it might be a it might be a moth trap in a field, you know, it, it, but but you can do the processing at the edge. Which is what we're doing in this case, we're doing all the processing, we're not sending anything off to be processed anywhere else. And the first example was image classification because that's actually the, probably the easiest thing to do. It moves up object detection, pose, how is, you know, what's somebody doing? Are they trying to attract your attention? Uh, you can train train for that very easily and they've got pre-built models. You can just play around with them. You don't even have to train your own data sets, speech recognition, gesture have fun playing with this it's so simple you can just click on here look try it on a raspberry pi and it will open up a tutorial and you literally just copy it onto your raspberry pi so so i i ran one back in uh back in fourth of march and here's the warning though i thought it was really great and i went to it today uh oh because it's not my note it's not my notebook i'm it's a github thing it's in public but somebody's whoever did it has removed it more likely not just removed it updated it so that it's not available they've taken it down so people don't get confused but because i knew it worked and if i now want to add uh, wood lice to my model so that i can just run it through exactly the same pipeline without any problem 
I fortuitously made a copy of it and worked from that, which is a good, good thing to do anyway. So here is uh, the actual training for the model. So this is this is the very crux of the deep learning. So uh, it, it speaks for itself. It, so this this is a, this is a Jupyter notebook, and the way that it works is there's lots of uh, text, just looks like a web page. It can have images on it and so on, but it, you can run lines of code here and uh, you can make your own Jupyter notebooks to share stuff, but it's, it's, it's just really very handy. So so before I could start, I would have to run this and you'll see that is pip again. So in this case, it's installing uh, a model maker, not on my Raspberry Pi, not on the computer I'm working at, but up in the cloud in my session on Google Colab. And then there's other required packages. This is typical of uh, working with Python. And then it goes on to give you an example. And you can, in these examples, you can click through one after the other. They even supply the data. So in, at, at the time, uh, their, this, this, their example was something to do with uh, flowers, looking at different types of flowers. Look, sunflowers, roses, dandelions, and so on. So I, I just uh, substituted, and in fact, it says uh, down here somewhere, uh, yeah, you can substitute your own data, obviously, your, your own training set. So I all of this stuff, I substituted my my earwigs and my my weevils. And, and, and it says just four lines of code, and it really is true. So I mounted my drive, which is where my bugs were, you see, uh, made a train and test out of the, it, it split the only 200 images, it split them into uh, 180 training, 20 for testing, uh, ran it. I gave it what the labels were, and it um, it created a created a model. It went through the the epochs of training. If you were running this on your personal computer, it'd probably take a few minutes, like Ed was mentioning before about processing power. Running on here, I think it took me. I don't know if it tells you how long it took. I don't think it was uh, more than a few seconds to train it. Uh, it. It tells you very successful. Look, the the accuracy increased with each iteration, right up to 98 and a half percent. Very encouraging. Uh, exported the model, and that was it. So the 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 outcome of this is that I have a model which I can run in my Raspberry Pi. Matt, can I ask a question? Yeah, I think I got distracted for a, just a second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, did I miss the part where you provided your training data on this? Yeah, so my training data, um, uh, I went through how I created it using the Python uh, and um, you know, the process of, uh, yeah, I, so I went through creating it. I, I linked to, I copied, so that so the stuff I created in here. So I, I made two folders, uh, and I, the, I put them in GitHub so anybody else can use them too. Um, so they're just two folders full of uh, images, and in my uh, Google Drive, I mounted uh, content drive, and I put put them into a folder called Bugs. So if I were to go to my gotcha. Google Drive now. That's where they are. So they're they're also in the cloud. And in gotcha. fact, get, getting your data set in the right place for the tutorials to work on is often the hardest hardest part of it. Um, so yeah, no, so I've done thank that. You, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I just missed the point where you said that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's what I was asking. Okay. So so having done that. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Matt. Uh, hmm. If I may have a question. Uh, yeah. So does it mean that it is then looking for the names in the names of the files or apart from the uh, from the images you have uh, uploaded some sort of a database? Yeah, no, no, I just I, I think um, it it used the names of the folders as the um, as the labels. Well, it couldn't be simpler. <laughs> really. Yeah, no, exactly. It, no, it literally when they said four lines of code, they meant four lines of code. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. And, the mo- and the model it produced, I was ex- fully expecting to have to play around with, you know, like I said before, maybe I do need like all 3,000 um, weevils and stuff. But no, it, I did it for the first time, 200 images of each, and it, it worked well. I mean, you can judge for yourself how well it worked later. I've got a few um, yeah. results, but uh, yeah. Okay, so the, the, this is a book of cats and this is a book of dogs and learn them. Yeah, yeah. That simple. Yeah. Yeah, and it produces uh, a model, and I'll show you the model. So, that, so then you, uh, I've, I've put that into my uh, Google as well. So, uh, Weevil Watch. So, uh, where did I put it? Python deployed. Is it in here? Yeah. So, so in here uh, is is all of the Python code that's actually on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, including things like a little shell script that, you know, when you power Raspberry Pi up, it starts the code running, uh, for example. Um, but here's the model. This is the this model is what was output from the previous step from the tutorial, and it, it put it into my Google Drive. And what's really amazing about it is look how look how big it is. Oh. <laughs> Three four megabyte. Yeah, wow, yeah. That's whereas, amazing. whereas if you're using object detection and you've, you know, you're using a, let's call it a full fat sort of uh, something running on something with GPUs and so on, this this could be easily be hundreds of megabytes, possibly even, even a gigabyte. Possibly. Even a gigabyte, yeah. And once, but once you get up to sort of the gigabyte size, then you're looking at running in the cloud on a, on on Amazon Web Service or something. And instead of processing it yourself, you would send the image to the internet and have it come back as a, you know, this is a so and so. Or in that image, we spotted six cats, and here's the locations on the image where we found them. That you know, but uh, but this. Could you, you know, say? Could you just say? for people that uh, are just thinking about this kind of thing for the first time, mm-hmm. a little bit about what's in this this weights file. Oh, or what okay. we use it, what we use it for, just what it, what is it for? It's the to make the predictions, isn't it? Yeah, it, well, yeah, so what it is, it's a, it's a neural uh, network. It's a, um, which, which comprises that there's a sort of a structure to the network and each of the nodes um decisions are made based on <laughs> weights and it's sort of during training the, it goes through these iterations and it tries all different combinations and the output of this is a fixed a fixed network with a fixed set of weights and when you input some data whether it be uh, you saw at the beginning it was talking about um uh, pose estimation. So pose estimation would be an image as well, but you can put in, uh, it's got optical character recognition, it's got um, sound, uh, it can it can monitor what you're doing on your phone to predict what you might like to do next, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so, so the way that it, the way that it's used, I can show you the actual Python the snippet of code that uses it, which is also very simple. So I, I bought in. So image classifier is provided by them. I didn't write this. Uh, this is this is for them. They they provide it for you, and you just import it. Uh, I mean, it's it's not it's not a lot of code, but it's you know, it, it's it's just off the shelf. But you import it into your code, and. Uh, so my my main code is report.py, and it's called that because you'll see later on that it generates a report. Uh, here are my imports. So I've, uh, amongst other things, I've now imported. Um, ah, OK, so I haven't imported it here because I've, I've made myself a another bit of code png classify that's what we'll look at that's that simpler so i i break i break it's good practice to break your big problem down into little chunks that you can then call so that when you read your code it actually makes sense so so in my deployed python i've got a thing called uh, png classify and what that does it's a, it's a good self documenting identifier is i send it a 100 by 100 png and it classifies it as a weevil or as a, a yeah, uh, earwig. So, uh, and and all, all it contains is a simple, I just wrote one function, I called it sorting hat, and 
um, it returns the image. So, so this this brings the image classifier their code. It imports that. It imports OpenCV, and all I do is I call this function and I send it. Um, well, the important thing that I send it is this image here, and it, it looks at the image, and it um, it makes a it makes a decision. And the, what I've done is I've I've uh, I've looked. So it'll give it'll give a class name. It'll uh, it'll it'll it, it gives you a sort of an array back. It, it, in this case, just an array of two uh, with scores. So it'll say something like. Uh, weevil 70%, earwig 30%. And I'm only interested in the highest score. And I've said that if that highest score is greater than 70%, just go with what it is. If it's less than 70%, unsure. So you'll see later on in some of the detections, it do, it is unsure. And that's what it means. It means it was less than 70% sure. Uh, and text, one thing that CB2 can do is put text, nice function. So it just writes at the bottom, uh, what what the uh, determination was and at what level of confidence. The maximum level of confidence is one. Uh, Fifty percent means it's no better than a guess. If there's if there's two, if you're you know classifying between two things. So so that's the uh, so just just with this little bit of code, you could feed in an image and you know it would it would tell you whether or not it thought it was a a weaver or an earwig. Um, OK, so but back to the main code. So this is the main code. Uh, lots of lots of imports uses matplotlib uses numpy because uh, Python and CV2 treat images just as three dimensional arrays of numbers. Uh, it's got some URL stuff here. You can see that when it was training, this is where it was uploading the training images to so that I could work on them from wherever I was. Um, OK, so it goes through a few steps. It, it, it initializes the camera. This is the resolution of the camera. And if you were doing object detection, for example, actually this would be too much. You, usually the first thing that happens in object detection is it gets scaled down to something like 400 pixels or something. And if you can imagine that picture with all the huddled together weevils and stuff, you can see that there, you, it would be really difficult to do object detection on that as opposed to just making a passport and classifying it. Uh, so the other thing I'm doing, I'm setting up some data containers for other things that I'm recording. So this thing runs through a 24 hour cycle. So I'm just made a few parallel arrays. So I'm going to um, monitor how many detections there are each hour, what the what the illumination was, what the temperature was on average and what the humidity was on average. And wow. there's a few uh, functions. So um, filter. You saw the utility filter. Well, this is just a repetition of that code. So every time it, um, it it gets a region of interest, it filters it in just the same way because, yeah, it doesn't want to be dealing with things that are ambiguous. Uh, it's got a function to upload the image to the web, upload a training image if that's the mode it's running in. Look, I won't go through everything on here, but the the mo the main. The main thing is that in within the code, there's a while true loop. And if you ever see that, what that means is that the section of code is going to run forever or, in, or until it hits some break condition or somebody turns turns the thing off. And, and what it's doing here, so on this first line, it turns the LED 15 on. That's the flash. Uh, it prints out some debug information. That's always good practice so that when you're running, you can see what's what's going on. Uh, samples what the time is so that it can put that onto the snap uh, then it it, it uh, waits for three quarters of a second lets the image uh, lets the intensity of the light stabilize does a capture of the camera and then from that point we've got um, an image which which uses the raw it doesn't use any uh, compression which is important because we we don't want to you know have any artifacts from jpeg compression or whatever whilst we're just cutting out our regions of interest and um yeah so it goes through it uh one yeah one of the things it does up here i'm not sure i'm gonna be able to see it is um it does the yeah extract so the, in this one you'll see it's got image a and image b that would be an image from 10 minutes ago 
this is an image now and it goes through and it it um, it actually subtracts one image from another and there's a function in OpenCV called subtract so you give it two images and it will return you uh, the difference between the two images and that's exactly what you want so if you've got a, a weevil wandering in and uh, you know it, it, as long as it's uh, yeah, it, it'll capture it if it wasn't there and it's there now. It captures it, creates the region of interest and uh, sends the region of interest off to be processed. So what does this give us? What was the point of doing all of this? Well, we've got uh, the results. So what happens is the an email is sent to the user or users, you can send it to as many people as you like and added to the email as attachments are uh, a representative image. I, I think that's probably the. Well, I can't remember when this image was taken, but it, it, it sends an image. I think it's probably the image where there were the most detections. Yeah, that's how it did it. It kept a, a tally of a number of detections. So the most detections that there ever were, were if you look actually over here at Weevil activity, you'll see it peaked at six and there's more than six circles but some of them will have been discarded look because of the filtering so there were six good images in here uh, so it, it saved that image to show show the user and then it takes the last 25 detections and allows the user a sort of uh, a mosaic of detections to just to see how things are going and it's quite interesting in here so you'll see that there's a couple where it's not sure and sometimes you think yeah fair enough it, half its legs are missing that probably confuses it um, but the, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that there is one missed detection uh, which here it thinks it's an earwig and you can sort of um, you know if you're trying to work out what <laughs> what, what what the neural network sees in inverted commas because of course it doesn't see anything but uh, interprets uh, so I guess yeah maybe it does look a bit like an earwig it hasn't got uh, what it hasn't got is the attributes of this weevil which is a perfect weevil down in this uh, bottom right hand corner so I think from this we could probably say well uh, yeah lo long sticky out straight legs makes you a weevil and if you haven't got those there's a fair chance you're going to get uh, miss, miss, um, misidentified. This guy was right on the threshold. <laughs> so, yeah, so so that's that. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I had it do is in matplotlib, I had it uh, write some charts, uh, convert them to JPEGs and send them along as well. So from the um, bottom chart here where you see light intensity like I said it was in the lab so we're only seeing a binary condition i.e lights on lights off if this were outdoor outdoors obviously this would be a very you know a, a gentle slope down to darkness and then back again as, as dawn came and uh, as a result you can see um sort of corresponding little change in relative humidity again because it's indoors uh, you see the temperature. Uh, what's this one? Uh, yeah, temperature ray, 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 rose a little bit at night. Who knows why? I don't know. Um, but most importantly, you've got weevil activity and you can see from this that just as it was expected from their behavior that uh, there are two sort of peaks of activity. And uh, what, what that is, it's basically whenever it uh, becomes daylight, they scuttle in mess around a little bit, do whatever it is the weevils do. And then uh, at night, in the middle of the night, when they notice that there's no light peeking in from the edge of their trap, every weevil has left at this point and they're out eating eating your crops. Um, and the, and the, the, the one other thing that can uh, the user can do, I programmed it, was that uh, the, the, the every 10 minutes the image this you know, akin to this image here is uploaded to the internet and um, so you can in almost real time you know maximum 10 minutes 
duration or lag, see what what's going on inside inside your trap. Um, which might be useful because uh, you know it might be full of poo or something. We try. <laughs> the idea is that it's maintenance free. You know, that you don't have to put any bait in it. You don't have to clear out dead bodies or anything uh, apart from poop. I don't think there's uh, anything to do. And that just leads us on to uh, suggested follow up research. Of course, the one thing that we really can't do, although we get an indication of activity, we're not counting weevils. It, it can't count weevils. So um, I'm wondering if there is, uh, you know, whether you could sort of map the activity um, to daylight to stuff and and you know do a ground truthing of the area and come up with a model so that you can say well you know if I'm seeing six weevils per hour that means that in the vicinity of this trap there must be 10 weevils per square meter or something of the kind uh, getting the data off this this we were fortunate because it was in the lab we were able to use wi-fi um, it may be that there, there isn't any um, communication to the internet from the location you're at. There's two ways you could deal with that. You could have a, um, a SIM card with data, so you could connect to the internet that way. Or if, let's say, it was in a strawberry farm and you did have people walking up and down the rows, um, you, potentially you could, as they went past, you could uh, uh, you, you could yeah, transmit the data at that point to their to their phones. Things that would be interesting to do is um, try different insects. It was pretty easy task, you know, going against weevils and earwigs, um, and try training it on images that weren't gathered from the camera. I think, generally speaking, it may it seems to me obvious that if you're wanting to classify something that's caught by the camera, then train it <laughs> for, for, on images that were. Uh, originated from the camera, but but who knows? Let, you know, it's certainly worth uh, investigating. So at that, I'm, I'll finish my thing and uh, throw it open for discussion. Thanks, Matt. That was excellent. I um I didn't. Now that I know you can make excellent uh, PowerPoint talks, I'm going to ask you to do it a lot more often. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um. <clears throat> How much data um, did you guys end up collecting overall is a question that I had. For example, do you think there could be enough data laying around to play with a statistical model to count the, the beetles? We have the, the pictures themselves that humans could look at for ground truthing. Yeah, unfortunately not. It only ran just for a very few days. And um, we actually, uh, whilst we had earwigs in for the training phase, we didn't have any earwigs uh, for the, um, whilst we actually ran it. So that was, uh, that was a shame. I wonder if the, um, <clears throat> if the classification for earwigs is, I mean, that's just something we had because the earwigs were on hand. And the real important thing is the classification for the the weevils. Yeah, but if if if, um, if you were the whole point of using classification was in the expectation other insects would go in. If if there's if there weren't going to be any other insects going in, you you could actually just do the whole thing using the classical. There's no point training it. You would just stop at the passport phase and say, here's an insect. Hmm. So uh, yeah, so. So it would be it would be really interesting to try it with lots more insects, particularly, and uh, you know, using the TensorFlow Lite, which is like super super lightweight, um, and then uh, you know, they're, they're, well, not not everybody will know, but there there are beefier processors on a similar footprint, like the Jetson Nano, for example, uh, which can run um, different, uh, you know, mobile net v2 and stuff like that. Uh, you know where 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 light where you get you can trade being lightweight for greater precision or accuracy or recall or whatever um and of course in this particular um project speed is almost irrelevant it, it really wouldn't matter if it took one minute 
to yeah. process one image or well no it would have one image but let, let's say we had a 10 the most we got was sort of eight or ten insects in on the move at once so i guess you know if, if you did it in four seconds you would be comfortable under lab conditions anyway yes yeah well that's it yeah it's a bit big unknown and of course the you know the whole thing would have to be a little bit if it was going outdoors as opposed to in a greenhouse it would need to be uh, waterproofed uh, yeah. um any other questions for matt does anyone have any questions matt do you like Oh, to, to ask just, just just a short question. I would like to ask where is that? Uh, I would gladly see that function that is calculating the moment uh, of the picture. And another one is what was the final uh, bit depth of the picture? Was it was it just one bit or it was more complicated? Uh, yes, just one bit. So. Um, uh, let me share my screen again. So the easiest way for you to act, you can access that code is I'll show you the um, I'll show you the website or the GitHub. So you can go there right now. I mean, if, if you can't find it, let me know. But this this yeah, should yeah. be this should be it. if I put it in the uh, chat. See if um, uh, where is the chat there? I rummaged a bit a lot, but I didn't see that where okay. it was. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So that, that that's where it was, and uh, and the what was it? Oh yeah, uh, the, the moment. Yeah, moment one. Uh, the moment one was this. Here's the easiest way to access that. But it's 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 literally just a uh, yeah. You get a binary image. So here I've just gone. I've, I've yeah, bought in the. You, image. You're not sharing the screen now. You're oh, not sharing the screen sorry. Right. Sorry. No. Hang on. You were a moment ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hold on. Share the screen. OK, yeah, so. Uh, so he, he, this is the actual function uh, in CV2. It's just called moments and and it takes. Um, what does it take? Uh, calculate the moments of the binary image. Oh, so Thresh is the name of the image. A binary image. It didn't start as a binary. It started as a color image here. Um, but first, I converted it to gray. So I went from three eight bit channels, mm -hmm. you know, red, green, blue, to a yeah. single eight bit channel, which is gray scale, zero to two five five. Uh, and then I thresholded the gray image further down to be a binary image. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I just selected halfway through, you know. Yeah, so this is empirical. It's empirical, yeah. But I mean, ju just by looking at my image, they're sort of almost grayscale anyway. There's almost no color in the trap. Quite likely, mm -hmm. we could have got away with just using grayscale all the way through, but uh, yeah, there there was no demand on memory or processing power, so I just let it let it run. Um, so that's that. Uh, so I will stop sharing. I'll just put that. The GitHub thing into the chat. Uh, that's that was the reason I stopped sharing. Hang on, um, chat. Okay. okay. Is, so that, that function moments was calculating a set of moments, and you were just choosing one of them to. Uh, ooh, hold on. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I don't, it, don't want to be you, picky on details, but it, it yeah, uh, was no, if, just okay, interesting. If you me. go to uh, the CV2 uh, open. Uh, Python Open CV2. All of the okay. functions are there with Good. examples and explanations. Yeah. In I'll find in the, the vignette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Matt, um, I just have another last question. Uh, as we're out of time here, we want to wrap it up here. But um, what is the? Is there a plan? Uh, I, I know that I'm involved in this, and the break, the communication when the project ended, we kind of haven't met all together. But I know some of us have talked in bits about it. But is there a plan to? Uh, develop it further that you know of would it, and do you think more importantly do you think that there would be room for um say a di data science msc project to move aspects of it forward for example to uh, do a counting uh develop the code so that it could count beetles and enumerate the beetles or maybe even calculate biodiversity from different animals uh yeah i mean 
uh, the counting of the Beatles, uh, that is a big, a big ask. Um, but absolutely, it's not, you know, I'm sure it's not beyond the wit of man. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it does hinge around getting it out into, you know, out of the lab, I think, doesn't it? So, Even just doing empirical testing would fit mm -hmm. in because it would still involve uh, um, playing with the code base that you've started and, uh, you know, deploying it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm perfectly happy. I mean, the device exists, still exists as far as I know. Um, I, I have one at least sitting right next to me. Oh, <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, so happy to support any student who wants to do something like that uh, with the nuts and bolts of it. Okay. I think I'm going to stop the video there. Any um, any final claims or comments? Thank you so much, Matt. That was um, really excellent. Um, would you be willing to uh, drop the PowerPoint into the chat? Uh, yeah, I can do that. You'll, you'll, you'll be the inaugural uh, lines on our new website.